Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have just a fascinating show coming right up. Our first guest today is Sarah Fraser of the Fraser Clan in Scotland, and she's here today to talk to us about her book, The Last Highlander. Sarah was awarded the 2012 Saltire First Scottish Book of the Year for her claim debut, The Last Highlander, which in 2016 also became a New York Times ebook bestseller. She's the professor of anatomy and forensic anthropology at the University of Dundee and director of the British Association for Human Identification. So let's welcome to the show, Sarah. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you very much indeed. It's just an honor to have you here. My goodness, you are, you're part of just this phenomenal story, it seems, you know. (laughs) (laughs) The phrases, you mean. (laughs) The Frasers, yeah, <laughs> and and not the the um, online special. I mean, not the Outlander movie. Actually, the real Frasers. Yes, they're they're quite a clan in in history. Ever ever since they arrived with William the Conqueror in 1066 and battled their way up the country, they've been appearing. They've been popping up in history at various times. <laughs> well, do you know, and before we get started in your book, The Last Highlander, which was a phenomenal read, I mean, it's so well, you did so much great research, it was so well written, you can just kind of feel okay. like you're in that time. You know, why don't you tell us a little bit about you, and how did you become inspired to write this book, and what started you on this path? Well, um, I married into the clan in the early 1980s. And I didn't know the Highlands very well. I hadn't been there. And I arrived in this very drafty castle in the north of Scotland. And my father-in-law was so worried about us getting um, dry rot and the whole thing falling down around our ears that he wouldn't shut the windows. So (laughs) there was a howling draft going through it. And one night, and the roof leaked a bit. And one night, uh, my mother-in-law got me up and said, Oh, Sarah, you must come and look at this. And down the tower, through the leak, rain had come, and then the frost set in, and there was this fairyland of stalactites and stalagmites of icicles inside the house. And I thought, (laughs) Okay, I'm somewhere different. This is... And I, I, I just... I was a young woman, and I started to look around at my environment, and the... The Highlands is in some ways a world apart, and it's still very informed by its Gallic culture and inheritance. And I really, the more, you know, I I started to have little children, Fraser children, who we brought up to speak Gallic. I had to learn Gallic. Hami brin Gallic and Rast. You know, I can I can speak Scots Gaelic still. So when they do all that Gaelic talk on um, hi, uh, the Outlander, I understand it. <laughs> I don't need the subtitles. Um, and <laughs> they get it right. I though. Was, that would be the next question. Um, <laughs> between ourselves, sometimes, you know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, you know how it goes. Yeah. Um, and but I was also intrigued by. Um, the sort of most notorious apple on the family tree, this guy, Simon Fraser, Lord Lovett, who who encapsulated such turbulent times for for Britain. Well, it it seems that he gained his notoriety over a land dispute. Well, yeah, he did, in that he was... It's one of those classic inheritance disputes. I mean, if there's anything mm-hmm. that a family or a region can fall out about, it's property and inheritance, isn't it? And um, he was the rightful male heir to Clan Fraser. He wasn't born there. He was the second son of the second son. But through a series of deaths, um, fortunate for him, tragic for others, he suddenly became the male heir. But he's the second line. And in the first line, they've only a widow and heiresses. Now, in clanship, I mean, again, where where that series gets it right, this is is a warrior society. Uh, Clans are tribal, semi-independent. I mean, that's what 
winds up the British government about them. They are so independent-minded, they're very hard to control. And what you have to do if you're left with a widow and, and female heirs is you marry one of these off to the male heir. Now, that would have been fine because that's Simon married to a female heir, and there he is, Lord Lovett, chief of Clan Fraser, and everything goes on as it was before, but for one small problem, which is that two neighboring clans have watched the developing situation in Clan Fraser, where male heirs are born and male heirs die, and they have been getting involved in managing the clan, and they are quite ready to carve it up and, and absorb it into their own clans. And the only thing that stands between the disappearance of Clan Fraser in about 1700 um, and, and, and success is Simon. He, he is the dividing line, and it's his, the force of his personality to keep that clan together that will, that will make it survive. And he's the reason, for example, I mean, these clans are called Mackenzie's and Murray's, and he is the reason that we are Fraser's today, that we aren't Mackenzie's or Murray's. It comes down to him. Well, and you can tell that you have such a passion for the writing of this book and, the, and you know, just finding out about the history of the Frasers and being really involved in that. I mean, it must have taken you a long time to do all that research. Um, yes, it does. And, you know, research is, is, is it's very beguiling because you, re, you get the voices of the people, you know, and you get their personalities, and you, you start to worry about them, you know, about if their children are ill. One of Simon's children once, he's um, playing almost a kind of marbles game with hazelnuts in front of the fire, and something falls out of the fire and burns him. And you, so you can get very distracted by that, but you, you need to bring those people to life, and um, that's what keeps a biographer going. They've got their place in history, but they are human as well and when they write to each other in the highlands and say oh heavens it's raining again you think oh yes i know this <laughs> it certainly is you know and you're almost talking to them but mm -hmm. you know nothing some things don't change um and you but you've got to embed it in this bigger history of um of of what we call the jacobite rebellion this this great period of transformation in British history where we become the United Kingdom effectively and the Stuart kings who are our hereditary rulers are put off the throne and we have Bonnie Prince Charlie's clan-powered odyssey to reclaim the thrones of his ancestors. And, and all of that is bearing on the Highlands because he has great support. The front-line troops in every Jacobite rebellion are Highlanders, time and again. Mm. Mm. Well, and it's interesting, and I didn't know this, it's, you know, in the book it talks about how, you know, if Simon says, hey, we are going to go and fight, you know, um, he doesn't really tell the rest of the clan what he's doing. He's just, they, they follow him. You know, there's this, this following that happens. Well, that's chief. I mean, there is a way in which a chief, um, an old-style chief, is an absolute ruler. That the clan, clan is structured around the chief. The chief in Gaelic is called Kian Kini, and Kian is Gaelic for head, and the Kinyog the ki is the kin, the kindred, and he is the head of the kindred, the Kian Kini. That's what he is. And they, so that binds him to them because the head without the body, the kindred is useless and the kindred without the head is useless. So they, you're right, they will do what he tells them to do. And because he gets into this inheritance dispute with the Mackenzies and the Murrays, which, mm -hmm. I mean, it lands him in so much trouble, he ends up being outlawed. His name, his estates, his property, everything is forfeit. Um, he has to involve himself in some awful shenanigans. He becomes a double agent. So he's spying for the government, but he's also a Jacobite officer. He's going back and forth and back and forth. And his kindred simply have to follow him, and they do. You're right. At one time, they're up for the Jacobites. And then 20 years later, they're out fighting for the government to prevent the Jacobites getting a toehold back in Britain. It's, it's, it, it's a, 
what they're looking for, they're always, the bigger picture here always is the well-being of the clan. You know, it's a very tight-knit, extended family network. It's an old-fashioned social grouping. And, um, you know, the modern British commercial state doesn't like it because they can't get a purchase on them, really. You know, they are very independent-minded. They're semi-autonomous still. When people in the Highlands thought of travelling to London, they made their will. There was no road in the Highlands until the 1720s. You were, cut, you, were, you were pretty much cut off. All the government wanted from you is that you were peaceful, that the government did, that the Highlands did not form the source of um, rebel forces, basically. So all they wanted was a peaceful Highlands, and they didn't much care how they got it. Yeah, it, it was just, you know, as long as they could have peace, they were good. That's all they wanted. I mean, what if ideally they would pay some taxes, the Highlands. Ideally, they might supply a few men to fight your European wars um, um, or a few commodities, maybe some black cattle. But what you really want is, is peace. You do not want the Highlands to be a backdoor for invasions. And, and the, the main invasion threat in the early 1700s to Britain comes from France. Louis XIV, the Sun King, is on the throne. He is the most powerful king uh, in Europe. And his, the Jacobites, Bonnie Prince Charlie, is his cousin. And he thoroughly disapproves of the British government putting Stuarts on the throne, off the throne, on the throne, off the throne. And he wants mm. his cousin to be put back on the throne. And he will use the clans and the Highlands as a backdoor into, into Britain. And um, that's always a worry for the British authorities, always. They just don't know what's going on out there. Well, and then Simon Fraser is, you know, he, he said he got into some trouble, had all his land forfeit, you know, and mm. because of this, this dispute, this, um, which it ended up saving the clan in the long run, you know. And mm, it, it did. he ended up fleeing to France. Yes, yes, he does. He's between 1704 and 1715. He is, he's on the run. I mean, the guiding principle of Simon's life, I always say that Simon was not a good man. You could never say Simon was a good man because he had an eye for the main chance. Where, wherever he thought he could be successful, he went. Um, he was quite Machiavellian. You know, he'd read Machiavelli at university that the ends justify the means. And mm -hmm. once he is outlawed, he can see there's no future for him in Britain. And he flees to France and he courts Louis XIV. He encourages Louis XIV to think that he can get in through the back door of the Highlands and filter down through Great Britain to London, 600 miles away, and put the Stuarts back on the throne. And he... He, he offers, he offers to, and to make an invasion plan for him, which he, which he actually does. But um, he's got a big problem in that Louis is at war with England through a lot of the period of the 1704 to 14, and then suddenly he makes peace. Now, once he's made peace with England, the last thing he's going to do is back an invasion to stir the whole hornet's nest up again. So suddenly, uh, Lover's got a problem. He's got a problem. He's, he's irrelevant. He's in, he's in exile in France. His ticket home has been taken away from him. His clan in the Highlands are being divided up between the Mackenzie and the Murrays. And uh, this is a very low point in his life. He's lost. He's lost the game. He's gambled and lost. It's a disaster. And so... I know that he ends up coming back to Scotland mm. and then things don't work out and then he ends up heading back to France and he gets locked up for 10 years in a French prison. Yes, he does. Well, that's, that's the period that ends in 1714. He, is, um, mm. he tries some double agenting. He tries to sneak back at one time and, and offers to sell out the Jacobites. You know, he's called the fox, the old fox. Um, he is cunning. He is... He is a double dealer, but his, his, his yearning always is to get back 
and preserve and promote the well-being of his clan. And he is frantic. So he makes a decision to try in the early 1700s to sell the Jacobites out to the British authorities. But that, that doesn't work. And when Louis discovers, Louis is just exasperated by him and locks him up. He likes Lovett personally, but really the man is, he's got to keep the man quiet for a while. Um, but the clan all this time, you might think, oh, well, he sounds like a nightmare. I mean, surely his clan are happy to get rid of him. But that's not the case. They, um, by 1714, they, they don't want to become Mackenzie's or Murray's. They want their, their chief. They want their natural chief home. And the elite the gentlemen of the clan get together and they basically draw straws and a man called Major James Fraser, Castle Leathers, uh, walks to Saumur. Now, I can't, in miles, I can tell you that's about, it's probably 1,500 miles um, yeah, to sure. find where, this is where Lover has been locked up and to bring mm-hmm. the chief home to lead his people. That is what he wants to do. And that, that's a turning point for Lovett. He's actually, he, he gets a new lease of life, and he comes home. He comes home, and he, he basically, this, he does align himself with the government forces. There's a new government in the UK. The uh, Queen, called Queen Anne, has died in 1714. It's the end of the Stuarts. We have a whole new dynasty here. They're called the Hanoverians. It's the beginning of what we call the Georgian period, you know, all the Georgian furniture and so on. And that dynasty is very unpopular. They are German. The king doesn't even speak English. They are loathed, and they need friends. And they'll even take on someone like the old fox, like Simon Lord Lovett. And he offers to help go and secure the highlands for them. In re- and what he wants in return from them is his titles and his lands back. That's the deal. He's he basically what we call getting in bed with the enemy. That's what he does. Mm-hmm. He, he'll do whatever it takes to ensure that his clan, you know, survives. Yeah, he will. He will. It's. I mean, this is. It, it's. It's. It's a. It's a traditional society. It's quite. Mm-hmm. It, the residue of it persists even today. You know, people are talked about being clannish. You know, oh, they're awfully clannish, you know, the this clan, the that clan, uh, meaning they stick together, they see themselves as one. And, and that, that, was, that was a successful functioning society still in those days. I mean, it's, it's ending, but if you're a member of that society, you want to maintain it. And he, and he wants to go back and preserve his culture. It's their shared values, their shared outlook, and it has a culture of mutual care. You know, we, all, we talk about today people becoming more isolated and communicating virtually and so on. They lived together, a very face-to-face society. The clan chief feasted his people. He was a good chief, love it. You know, when famine struck, which they did with monotonous regularity, he would remit the rents from his kinsmen. And they are still paying rents partly in kind with cheese and chickens and barley. And he would redistribute that to maintain his people and to keep them in good health. And there is this duty of care. I mean, the primary virtue of clanship in Gaelic is gian, and it means protection, protection and mutual security. And, and this is in the heart of him. All, all this pol- political games playing and Machiavellian mm. stuff that Lovett does on the surface, underneath there is always this anchor of clanship, 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 and the clan. He must protect his people. His story is just so fascinating and so amazing. Mm. I mean, it's, you, you read it, and it's just like, my goodness, there, there was a lot <laughs> of um, stuff that went on. <laughs> but at the same oh. time, I mean, <laughs> and, turbulent times. Uh, I think we'd have to call them turbulent times. Turbulent Marianne, time, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. When when you were doing the research for this book, did, yeah. was there anything like that you discovered that you found to be amazing, or in this probably in his case, you know, he is the fox, you know, shocking that you were kind of going through, going, really, this happened? I can't believe. Oh, <laughs> yes. Oh, dear, there's one thing. There's one thing. I thought I'd slightly hopped over it earlier. 
But it's this moment where the clan chief dies. The first, the first clan chief I referred to earlier, mm-hmm. he dies in fifteen in sixteen ninety six, and Lovett naturally, as the well, he's Simon Fraser at that point, as mm-hmm. the male heir, should be married to the female heir to secure the clan, and he makes overtures to the widow of the late chief, and to to have her daughter's hand in marriage. Well, the widow of the late chief is a daughter of one of these predatory clans, the Murrays. And the Murrays quickly remove the heiress. So, you know, actions are louder than words, and they they get rid of the heiress, so he's not going to be marrying her. And he thinks, well, I've got to act quick here. And he gets hold of, I mean, this is incomprehensible to us today, he gets hold of a band of armed men, and they gallop over the hills out of Inverness, Along the Firth, it's, there's a sea inlet west of Inverness towards Castle Downey, which is the stronghold of Clan Fraser, where the dowager Lady Lovett, the widow, is. And he goes rushing in and says again that he wishes to marry and will the widow marry him, and that will secure things and that will secure the clan. And she refuses him. Um, but Lovett is not going to take no for an answer this time. He is coming up against so much opposition from these powerful Mackenzies and Murrays. And the records say that a bagpipe was called for and the parson brought in and the pipe was blown up to basically cover Lady Lovett's screams and shouts as she is forcibly married to Lovett. She is then taken to a bedroom and thrown on a bed and her bodice cut off with a knife and Simon comes in and uh, the marriage is consummated and the next day they are man and wife and there is the poor old parson is put on a horse and sent back out into the rain to Inverness and he has effectively forced a marriage and perhaps raped into submission the widow of a chief and the daughter of a marquis and all hell breaks loose when he's done that um Mm -hmm. and that that i found truly shocking and i thought you know you you have to get back into the mindset of how they thought in 1696 and forcing marriage on women was a convention because in in that sort of level of society, I mean, you know, you think, God save me from being an aristocrat, you're going to have an arranged marriage and it's Mm -hmm. dynastic and you're going to be married early. You know, most people of the middling sort married as late as possible simply because for the women it meant an endless series of pregnancies. But for a dynastic marriage, they want all those pregnancies, so they marry them young and they are forced to be married. Um, and, and it just, she knows Simon. I mean, it's not as if she doesn't know him, mm. um, Amelia Murray Lovett, but that's really hard for us in our days to get around. It's, it's, it's very difficult to write that and for Simon to come out with any credit from it at all. I mean, he's doing it because that's clan convention, yeah. but it's still unacceptable. I mean, it's to- and that was really shocking. That, that's, that's difficult. It's difficult to write about, and it's difficult, it's difficult to like him afterwards for a while, it has to be said. Um, yeah, well, he's it, taken to court. I mean, and, and that's kind of where the beginning of his, his downfall in some way, when things, where he starts to gain that yeah. notoriety. Yes, he does. He absolutely does. I mean, he's charged with this incredibly old-fashioned, ancient crime of rapt and hame sucken and what that means um that bad. Is the, <laughs> it sounds really awful doesn't it it's a capital <laughs> crime so it should be it's um it's the ravishing of ladies in houses of consequence so there you go and um it is a capital crime and he is uh, charged in Edinburgh in absentia because he's not daft, he's going to lose his head if he goes to, or he's going to be hung. Um, But what is interesting is that he has lived with the new Lady Lovett, his new bride, 
for several months. And when her brother, who is the head of the Murray clan, uh, calls her to court to testify against him, she won't come. She won't come. And um, she seems to think she was properly married and she was, um, she was going to just make the best of it. She was going to resume her mm-hmm. position as Lady Lovett and make the best of it. And she is loyal to him in a strange way, all the way up to the point of his death. She outlives him. And, um, you know, she offers to come and be with him at one point before his death. It's, um, it's, it's a very, very odd period, and, and it's, it's both shocking. And her parents, her mother and her sisters-in-law, are writing to each other, saying, I can't get Amelia to talk. I can't get her to condemn this wretch, Simon Fraser of Beaufort, who is Lord, calling himself Lord Lover. What are we going to do? And she has decided... She has taken matters into her own hand. But, you know, women were so powerless then. You know, it's, she's, she's, a, she's a, a political pawn, you know, poor woman. And, and a lot of times they were, you, I mean, used for, you know, transference of wealth or what have you, you know? Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. She comes with the Fraser clan. I mean, that seals the deal, you know, and, um, and, um, yeah, she, she is a dynastic pawn, and I, and I think, I mean, I think there is a reason she doesn't do it. You know, honor. They, they, in, funny enough, sex is not something that they get hot up about. If you think of all the sex scandals, we've got a huge sex scandal going on over here at the moment to do with um, MPs in our parliament, uh, and, of course, Harvey Weinstein. But it's, um, that's not something that exercises them, honor exercises them and the, your good name. And that isn't expressed by your sexual habits. It is uh, your reputation in other ways and keeping your good name, your word, and so on. And I think she doesn't speak up partly because what will her reputation be? You know, she will be the subject of the scandal sheets of Europe and Mm -hmm. she will lose her honor and her reputation and she can keep it if she stays married to him. She's, She's this silent figure. Everyone's trying to get... Amelia's views out of her and she won't give them up and that to me if you're asking what was really shocking and thorny and difficult that whole area was oh, I bet yeah and it it sounds like I mean she was just you know an extremely smart woman too to also think ahead mm-hmm. and what does it mean because yeah. it's a totally different time so you have to really immerse yourself mm-hmm. in that okay. era to understand not just the customs but also you know, you know, as a woman that's um, in this situation, you know, like what are her options? And there are not many. No, no, there aren't many. I mean, there really aren't many. I mean, there is a way, and she can keep. I mean, I think the reason she refuses to marry him is that she, mm-hmm. she suddenly has a little bit of autonomy. As the Dowager Lady Lovett, who is in charge of the little female heiresses, she, she suddenly has a little bit of self-determination, which, of course, she loses the minute she marries again. I mean, I'm with Amelia on this. I wouldn't want to get married again, you know, at that yeah. stage. Yeah, I guess um, you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, I think, why I would think you? That's great. Be, yeah, be, you know, be in charge and, you know, have your own you yeah. know, independence and do your own thing. Why get married, yeah. you know? and. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, the men, the male, because it is a male-dominated, clans are male-dominated for the most part from what oh, I yeah. understood. You know, so we, you're, well, kind of, you're kind of stuck. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the patriarchy is ruling from, from, sorry guys, but from coast to coast of the known world. So, yes, if you can carve out your own bit of territory, you'd do it, wouldn't you? <laughs> In a heartbeat, in a heartbeat. So, you know, extremely brilliant woman, you know, to be able to say, no, I'm just mm. going to keep things as so until and the unfortunate happens, you know, which is awful. Yeah, but exactly. It, it sounds like she made the best of the situation for her based on I think what she was did. going on. And, yeah. And then to, uh, yeah. who knew? Yeah, it's an interesting situation. It's difficult. Goodness. Yeah, it, it would it would be you know, and it kind of brings me to, and I think I have enough time for a, another question here, but it kind of brings me to mm. just, I mean, the uh, kind of the rise of the Outlander 
uh, movie, yeah. um, the series. I mean, and it, I'm sure because they, pro, you know, like all series, they have some good things and some things are like, well, oh, that's so off base. That's not even close. Mm-hmm. You know, in general, how how do you think that you know the Frasers feel about it? Because it is bringing a lot of attention to the Fraser um, clan. Um, I think I think they feel fine about it. Just you know, because it is. Um, you're right. It puts, but it puts the spotlight on the region, and this is this can this can so easily be one of those forgotten corners and times of history, and that's brought it right back to the front of the stage, to the front page news, and um, I think that um, also from a, his, a history point of view, there are certain things that um, Diana Gabaldon got right. I mean, I saw those first episodes after uh, the Battle of Culloden, and those are brutal, and it was Mm -hmm. brutal. Um, I think that um, Bonnie Prince Charlie, I don't agree with how she's done that, because he's got to be somebody worth following. And you do slightly think... What? They all went off and went out for him. Um, I know. And I, I'm guessing. <laughs> I agree with you on that. Because yeah. <laughs> he seems oh. like such a weakling. It's like, that guy? You guys are going to follow him? Yeah. <laughs> I know. And I don't think that's right. I think he was charismatic and, mm-hmm. um, and a compelling character. You know, Lovett, when he first arrived in, the, in Scotland in 1745, Lovett told him to go home until he had a proper invasion plan. But <laughs> apparently, once you met him, he was easy to refuse uh, at a distance. Once you met him, he was irresistible, apparently. He really had. Mm-hmm. He was a golden boy. A, a, a golden boy on a mission, and there's something about golden boys. They are, you know, they make us laugh because they think they can do anything. You know, they're like Icarus. They can fly to the sun. But, of course, what they don't ever see is the downside. They're really bad at planning and compromise. And um, But I think he was an attractive character, and I'm guessing that, I haven't asked her, but I'm guessing that Diana makes him a bit of a weed, uh, Charlie, I mean, so that he's not competing with our brawny hero, Jamie, because he's got to be the focus of all the action. Um, and he's and I'm the supposing focus of all the right. action. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, isn't he just? <laughs> Crikey, never stops. <laughs> I know, really. It's made, it's made the, the series very entertaining, I'll tell you. But, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. it's so interesting to talk with a Fraser and just see how you feel ab- about that, because I... You know, you, you hear about sometimes series are done and, and they're not really giving a whole lot of consideration to the ancestors that are, or the history of the yes, clan yes. or the family or what have you. So it's so, I find it fascinating to hear what, what your thoughts of it are. So. Thank you. Yeah, and I also like, I tell you what I think also is right, is I like um, the fact that the, there is space for the heroine. Um, Claire, mm-hmm. the heroine, because there is a place in Gallic society for strong women. If your men are going off fighting feuds, um, or if they've been called to fight in some kind of national conflict, a lot of time the women are left at home, and they are feisty, outspoken, strong women who've got to control the situation at home. And, and a lot of them are extremely strong-minded and outspoken indeed. That's even within the context of this um, of Simon um, molesting the um, Amelia Lovett Murray. Um, once they get airspace, they are, I think, would be quite recognisable to you and I. You know, it's it's only within the context of of male society that we don't understand. But but once they're, you can see them clean of men by themselves. I think I think they were strong women. Mm-hmm. Well, another good, and I know this is going back to the fiction part of it um, outside of your book, The Last Highlander, but when we look at outlanders like um, Jamie's sister, Laura. Um, yeah. Is it Laura's her name? Yeah, she's a... No, you Jenny. Can see where she's... A, yeah, Jenny. She's a strong character yeah. that you see that yeah. you're talking about where, the, you know, the men are taken off and she's holding down the fort and she can she can hold her own, you know? <laughs> Yeah, that's that. That I think is accurate. Kusi, 
we call it in Scotland. She's a she's a coosy lass. Mm. Well, and uh, man, I, I just applaud you. I mean, it's so well written. I really enjoyed your book, The Last Highlander. There's still time for people to pick it up for um, holiday gifts. And if you have somebody you don't know what to get, this is the book, <laughs> The Last <laughs> Highlander. So, oh, yes, of course. And, you know, Sarah, so where can people connect with you to be part of your community and learn more about all the great stuff you're doing? Um, well, I'm, I'm on Twitter at um, Sarah underscore Fraser UK. And I've also got a, a website where I post blogs about Highland and clan history, trying to just, I take an incident or a person and I try and bring them to life. Um, and um, also on Facebook, I have a Facebook page as well. Again, Sarah underscore Fraser UK. And um, that's, that's where I'm, and I welcome any comment there. Oh, and uh, your website, sarahfraser.co.uk, and we'll have that link where people can click on it and learn more about that and be part of your community. You know, I've actually been listening to your videos that you have and reading your blog, and I've signed up for your newsletter, and wow, you've got some just stunning information. So, you know, Sarah, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us here today. My goodness. Well, thank you, Marianne. I've I've loved it. It's great. Very good to talk to you. (laughs) It has been fabulous. We are going to pause here for a quick break, and we'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com Do you know that you can become a genius at any age? Do you know that you can change your life and create a brilliant life for yourself? Hi, I am Olympia LaPointe, an award-winning rocket scientist who you more than likely have seen on TED Talks, Impact Theory, and PBS. Check out my latest book, Answers Unleashed, The Science of Unleashing Your Brain's Power. Simply go to AnswersUnleashed.com books and check it out for yourself. You'll find the tools to help you create the life you've always wanted. The highly acclaimed and newly released book, The Hand Part 2 by Lynn Van Prague Grattan, describes the journey between a psychic medium and a family who lost a son. Messages from Beyond Eternity's Gate is of love and healing. For more information, visit www.lynnvanprague-grattan.com. That's www.lynnvanprague-grattan.com. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. My goodness, it's so easy to see why Sarah's book was a New York Times bestseller. We have an amazing guest coming right up. Eileen Godoski Marino is here today to talk to us about her book, The Colorful Kitchen. Now, Eileen is a certified health coach, recipe developer, and food photographer. Before that, she studied textile design, and she's here today to share with us her work 
The Colorful Kitchen, which is also based off a blog that she does, which is hugely popular. So let's welcome to the show Eileen. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to chat with you today. Oh, I, you know, I'm so glad that we're having this discussion. And gosh, the New Year's just right around the corner. What a better time than now to talk about, you know, getting some great recipes down and learning how to maybe cook with a little bit of a healthier approach. I agree. I think this is the perfect time of the year to start thinking about it and start making some small changes. <laughs> so why don't you share with us, like, what started you on this path of plant-based foods? I mean, because it, it, it's not something that most people fall into. You know, it, it's uh, sometimes it's done because we feel a certain way in regards to, like, animals or maybe it's a health concern, but it's always, I'm always fascinated by what starts people on their path. Absolutely. So I think it's always, I agree, it's always really different for everyone. And for me, uh, I think around the age of nine, I started to make the connection between the meat on my plate and animals. And the idea of eating animals just didn't feel right to me. And so I decided to be a vegetarian, but my family had a very standard American diet. We didn't eat very many vegetables. I didn't like very many vegetables. And there were so few foods that I actually wanted to eat that I subsisted on grilled cheese sandwiches, microwave veggie burgers, and french mm-hmm. fries. And so I was not eating in a healthy way at all. And so I sort of, I would spend a few weeks eating that way, and then I would decide to eat meat again. And I really went back and forth, and I just didn't know what to eat. So it, I, it didn't stick until I was 18 and I was in college and I was a vegetarian for a few years before starting to look into veganism and the way that that started it uh, was because I had a whole slew of health ailments and these had been going on my entire life. I had a ton of, I always had stomach aches and just digestive issues and I never felt good after eating and I also had a lot of really severe allergies so I was sneezing and coughing and watery eyes every single day and I was on three different types of prescription medicines but they never really helped. I would just feel really drowsy and I felt like I was taking so many pills, but nothing was getting better. And so one day I just sort of had this idea that maybe I could feel better. Maybe this isn't normal. And I started to, and so I had heard about the natural biotic diet and how it was sort of this miracle cure-all. And I had heard these urban legends of people who had cured themselves of cancer and really serious diseases and I thought if it could work for these people that I don't know if these stories are true or not maybe it would work for me so I just kind of I just went into it and tried it and it was it was like stepping into this whole new world I had no experience with cooking vegetables I had never eaten quinoa this was over 10 years ago so Mm -hmm. these types of foods weren't trendy like the idea of a green smoothie wasn't it wasn't like a something you could just go and order at any restaurant. And it yeah. was before before you could get kale chips at any grocery store. So I felt like every food I was eating was so foreign. But after a few days, I realized that I just felt good in my body. And I didn't get, I wasn't having stomach pain after I ate. And so I just decided to stick with it. And by the end of the first month, all of my allergies were gone. And I was able to go off my all my medications. And I was just this completely new person. And I'd like to say that's the end of the story and it's been happy since then, but it's not quite that simple. Mm -hmm. The way I was eating was so complicated and the recipes I was following took hours and hours and I felt like my entire life revolved around preparing these types of foods. And so eventually I started to deviate a little bit from the traditional macrobiotic diet and I experimented with raw food and all sorts of different ways of eating and After a year or so of doing that, I just started to be able to listen to my body and eat what I was craving, and I was able to tell what was making me feel good and what wasn't. And in the end, that ended up being just a whole foods, plant-based diet, and I've been eating that way for the past 10 years or so. Oh, my goodness. Hey, what a great story, because when you make that kind of a shift, especially when you've got ailments and to have that kind of a reaction where, gosh, everything now is, is different. You know, you're not having 
the allergic reactions that you were before to, to the foods you were eating, was it a lot like just trial and error and just to find out what made you feel good? Absolutely. So I kind of, it was somewhat of an, elimina- an elimination diet in a sense that I was eating so few foods that once I started mm-hmm. adding things back in, I could tell what was what was working and what wasn't. And one thing that was huge for me was dairy. Like I realized that was the cause that was the cause of many of my allergies and my stomach issues. So just getting that off of my plate made a huge difference. And then I wasn't sure maybe it was wheat. So I did spend a few years where I didn't eat any gluten at all. But over time, I realized that I can have a I can have some forms of gluten and. That was a huge trial and error type of thing. And I think it's really just listening to, learning how to listen to your body. And that in itself is trial and error. Well, it's so interesting because, you know, I've heard time and time again when people do remove gluten and dairy and different things like that from their diet, how their health is just so impacted in a positive way. And, you know, it's not to say that that works for everybody. We're not giving medical advice. But it's, you know, you have to see what your body says is good for you and what's, what's working. Absolutely. That's, that's exactly what my journey was all about. Oh, my goodness. Well, when you started getting into because I know that's like you touched on, like it took you a lot of time to make, you know, certain things. And I think a lot of times when people think of plant-based diets, they're like, ooh, that is going to be a super. I've got to, I've got to like prepare like a lot of stuff, and it's going to take a ton of time. Is that kind of the case, or no? Um, yes. Yeah, so that's definitely a stereotype, and I think that can be the case. Not, that was my situation for the first few months, but that absolutely does not have to be the way it is. There's no reason that eating a plant-based diet would be any more or less complicated than having not eating a plant-based diet. And I think you can keep it really simple with foods like smoothies where you just throw everything in a blender, roasted vegetables, pasta. You can, you can really just keep it simple. And I think one of the things that's made a really big difference for me is learning how to batch cook. And so, preparing a lot of food at once that you can eat throughout the week and reheat in different ways makes it really simple. And just just sticking with the natural flavor of foods also keeps things really simple. Like you don't have to go crazy with the spices and the sauces, the vegetables and fruits and all of that in and of itself is it's so naturally full of flavor and a little salt and pepper and olive oil really can do the trick sometimes. Well, so you touched on spices. And that's like another thing that people think of because I know back in the 80s, I think it was in the 80s, when they came out with those rice crackers, people yes. would compare them to siding. It was like, I'd rather <laughs> eat cardboard than this because it was just, it was so tasteless and it was like a chore to eat it. And so for people that move to a more plant-based diet, you know, it doesn't mean that the food is void of taste. No, I, I think it's the opposite. For me, it was completely the opposite because the way I used to eat before were super plain foods, a grilled cheese mm-hmm. sandwich, mashed potatoes, french fries. Those are foods that are, they're all bland, like colorless. And the way I eat now, it's, it's so much, it feels like I'm eating so much more flavor and it's so much more creative than the way I ate before. Yeah, it just has such great. Now, I know you've got recipes that take like like hardly any time to prepare. Yes, I love having recipes like that. I, I like to have some things that can be put together in five minutes or less. I think that's the easiest way to eat. Mhm, and just makes it. Yeah, you can get, I mean, because you've got some really great recipes in here for main courses and salads and vegetables and desserts even. And I was like, wow, there's so much in your book that I want to try. And I'll be cooking up a storm like nobody's business because it it looks like just great (laughs) food. And it's nice to know that it's also healthy for you. Yes, that is, I think for me, if it's not going to make me feel good, then I don't want to eat it (laughs) no matter Mm -hmm. how no matter how good it tastes, if I'm going to feel bad afterwards, it's not really worth it. So I like to have all of my recipes look good and make you feel good. Well, and, you know, I I read on your website that you eat 
your re- you know, it's not like you just make these recipes or create these recipes and then that's it. These are actually recipes that you use it within your own home. Absolutely. I'm I'm definitely not one to leave food and my husband has a pretty good appetite. So we, everything <laughs> that you see on my website, everything that you see in the book, um, mm-hmm. I ate. I, I wrote most of the book while I was pregnant. And so that might have <laughs> helped with being able to get rid of some uh-huh. of the extra food we had laying around. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure, you know, since you're feeding, two, you know, for two there, you know, it's kind of easy to look at everything going, well, that looks good. And, you know, but the things that you have, you know, the recipes you have in here, like chocolate chip, banana bread, granola, uh, granola I mean, that looks absolutely just to die for. So you oh, I love that recipe. That, yeah. <laughs> well, and and so when you were getting this together, your cookbook together, was it because you had so many of your fans? Because I know you have such a huge following online. And you get people from all over the world that are connected with you and, and following your recipes and the different things that you do. So was that the reason that you developed the book? Or it was just like, you know, I've got to get all these recipes out there because my friends keep asking me for them. Um, definitely all, all of that. Um, and just, I've always loved cookbooks. And I think there is something, you can go on my website and you can search for the recipes and you can find things that I've shared, but there's something a little bit different about a cookbook in that it's a complete story. And you have it just right there literally in the palm of your hand. And you can just flip through it and you can see the way that the recipes could go together. And it's just, it's more of a narrative. And so I did have a lot of people asking me, you know, you've been doing this blog for a few years now. Like, when are we going to get to see these recipes in print? And I think that as lovely as blogs are and sharing photos on Instagram of food and all of that, people still like to have a cookbook that's a physical object that they can hold and reference and they can write their own notes on and mark the pages. No, oh, I, I would agree with that. I love having a cookbook that I can sit down and browse through and then kind of just decide what it is that I'm going to be, you know, what I'm going to make and then make plans for, you know, maybe if I'm making, like how you talk about making batch food, like, okay, if I'm going to make granola, you know, the, the granola we were just talking about, you know, I'll I'll put a little bookmark there and then look at something else right. possibly for dinner. So you can just kind of get all the cooking done at like one time. Definitely. And you can bring the book to the store with you and have everything right there. Oh, you're not a, you, you can actually take it to you. They're not going to check it in at the front <laughs> counter because I, I'm sure they would because they want to keep it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I definitely have gone to the grocery store with a cookbook under my arm mm-hmm. because, you know, it's, sometimes you just want to decide when you're in the store. Yeah, and kind of decide when you're, you're going from there. So, and these, if I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, these recipes, they sound like they're very personal to you. Definitely. Um, a lot of the things for the book are recipes that I've been making for years or somewhat of a version of something that I've been making for my family, and it's what we eat, and I do have an emotional connection to it, and there's a story behind it. Mm-hmm. On each each recipe that's made, and you can see that because, you know, you're not – a lot of times, I mean, and I've pulled recipes off the Internet. I'm sure many of our listeners have as well. When you pull a recipe off the Internet and you, you make it and then it doesn't taste so good, you're like, wow, that was really a waste of my time and that was horrible. So, you know, you can tell that they didn't take the time to test it out and see how everything would come together. You know, I think the last time I made something like that, the there was a pie that never it would never set in the middle. I'm like, well, what the heck? <laughs> right. It, yeah, they're definitely, I mean, for me, it was a different process because when I share a recipe on my blog, it's sometimes mm-hmm. something that I've made multiple times, but sometimes it's just a dish that I came up with, I made it once, and then I shared it. But for the cookbook, I retested and retested the recipes myself, and then I also had 20 recipe testers who went over the recipes to make sure that the instructions were crystal clear and that everything mm-hmm. worked the way it says it's supposed to work. So it's just a different level, I think, of yeah, putting just, it together. And but I think it's fine. I mean, when you a blog is a more informal way to share recipes. Mm-hmm. Well, and so with, from all the recipes that you have, in we'll, we'll start with like the entrees. What's your favorite one? Oh, that's a tough. I know one. it's tough, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I would say there's there's a recipe for. Um, a vegetable teriyaki stir fry 
Mm-hmm. And it's very simple, but it's a dish that I've been making at least once a week for years. And what I love about it is that the recipe calls for a certain vegetables, but it really works with any vegetable. So if you go to the farmer's market or the grocery store and whatever's in season, you can really use in the summer. You can use a lot of zucchini. In the winter, you can add sweet potatoes in. And any whatever's in season will taste delicious with the sauce. And then there's the baked tofu and the rice on the side. And it just feels like a really hearty, complete meal. Yeah, it's it's just a, a great meal to dive into. Now, what if you have people over that um, are... Um, you're used to having meat. I know you have some meat substitution recipes in there as well. Yes. So um, tempeh and tofu make really good meat substitutes. You can definitely buy like a faux chicken or a faux beef product at the store. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people really enjoy those. But um, I didn't include any of that in my book because I wanted it to be all whole food, whole food based recipes. Um, Mm -hmm. so for that, I would say the people who think that they're maybe going to miss having meat and something, you just make them the recipe as is and see if they notice. And for the most part, they'll probably be interested. They'll probably like the way it tastes and maybe hopefully have the reaction that they don't even need the meat. Yeah. Yeah. I, I totally get that. And, you know, it's, you've got so much great information that I've just been kind of pouring through on your website. I'm sure I probably saw it there because I was looking at it. It's like, oh, okay. What if we have somebody that's a meat eater? How can you, you know, because I, I know they've come out with some really good like veggie burgers and stuff like that, that you can't, like people can't tell the difference. Yeah, definitely. I just had one called the impossible burger and it's supposed Mm -hmm. to, Ha- it's supposed to bleed the way meat was so, um, when you bite yeah. into it, and it was it was almost scary how similar similar it tasted. Yeah, well, and and the thing is, is that you know that you're not getting that fat that is in a lot of the meats. You know, if people are watching their cholesterol or right. you know, j- just trying to cut down on on um, different fats, that, that's something that can be done. Yeah, definitely. That's, I think starting, if you're trying, if you're interested in transitioning to a plant-based diet, I think those types of foods can be really great. So you don't feel like you're missing out on anything. And then when you start to get more comfortable, you can start to experiment with things that might be more foreign, like tempeh and tofu and seitan and all of that. Mm-hmm. And then take it from there. Well, and so, um, so how about families that are looking to incorporate more of a plant-based diet and introduce that to their children. Um, what are some of the favorites that the kids like? Um, that's it. So that's something I think about a lot because my daughter is now 15 months. And mm-hmm. so she uh, is starting to become a little picky with the food that she eats. And one recipe from the book that I've been making, and it's actually a recipe that's from my blog and it's the most popular recipe on my blog. So I decided to include it. In the book, it's my sweet potato mac and cheese, and mm, the sauce. I was just is, looking at that. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. So the sauce is a sweet potato base instead of there instead of like a vegan cheese or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So it's just sweet potato, and there's nutritional yeast and garlic and mustard. And my daughter goes crazy for it. She loves that recipe. Um, another thing that we do a lot, and I hope to continue doing as she as she gets older, are green smoothies. And that's a really great way to sneak a lot of vegetables into your kid's meal because they're drinking a smoothie and it, it would taste, you know, it tastes like fruit, but there's greens in it. Um, and you can add toppings and make it into more of like an ice cream type of thing. There's a recipe in the book for a banana soft serve, which is like a really thick smoothie that's the texture of frozen yogurt. And you can add all sorts of toppings and that's really fun for kids because it's like eating ice cream. Oh my gosh, you're making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great dessert recipe. So I might make that when we get off the phone. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, if you live closer, I'd be over there and having some with you. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you know, and so what's really cool is, is like you can start to incorporate some of these foods. You know, for for families, they can start incorporating some of these foods into their children's diets, 
without having it to be like a big deal. And it's still something that, like how you were saying, it tastes sweet. It's, you know, it's veggies, but it, it gets them used to eating something a little bit on the, you know, and on a, a healthier side for them. Definitely. And I think with, you know, kids or parents or husbands, wives, anyone in the family who might be resistant to something that's labeled as vegan or healthy, I think the best mm-hmm. tactic is to just not mention it. Just make the recipe. Don't, you don't have to tell them how it's so good for them and there's this in it and kale and all of that. You just give it to them and they'll most likely enjoy it. And then they'll start getting used to eating foods <laughs> like that. And then if they want to ask you what's in it, I think that's so much better than you trying to t- explain to them why it's so good for them if they're hesitant and they're not really interested in that side of it. Well, I, I would agree with you on that because I think if you go over this long description, as soon as people get to kale, it's like, ooh, kale, you know, because <laughs> kale can be, <laughs> it can be great Definitely. when they make kale chips, but when, you know, sometimes, you know, a lot of people think when you put it into a smoothie, it's going to be really not so good, but that's not the case. Yeah, yeah, I think the best thing about green smoothies is that you usually can't taste the greens. Oh, you love that. My goodness, who doesn't mm-hmm. love that, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so, we, so we've got the meat eaters covered, we've got the kids covered, you know, because I know this book is really based for anybody. Yes, that was really my goal that, you know, if you're vegan or vegetarian, you would enjoy it. And also, if you're not, if you, if you eat meat and you eat dairy, but you want to add more plant-based dishes into your diet, I, I want the recipes to be for you. And I want the ingredients to be things that people can find anywhere. They don't have to go to a fancy national food store. You can really just get the ingredients anywhere you shop and however you like to eat it. Okay. Well, and, you know, that brings me to my next question, because a lot of times people think when they have to eat this way, that it's going to be super expensive. Is that really the case? Um, Okay. So I think it can be because, and I, this was my problem early on, that Mm -hmm. I would go to the grocery store and I would buy the really fancy vegan cheese and I would buy all of these meat substitutes and prepared foods that were really expensive and I would buy all of these things like you know things labeled as superfoods like different types of powders and supplements and then I sort of realized that I was spending so much more money on groceries than I needed to be and when I really scaled it back and looked at what I was buying Mm -hmm. it wasn't the it wasn't what I needed to follow the type of plant-based diet that I wanted to and really just focusing on produce, um, shopping from the bulk section where like the greens and the beans and all of that are, I realized I could actually spend a lot less money than I had been before. So to answer your question, no, it does not need to be more expensive. The problem is sometimes it's very easy to think it needs to be more expensive and just spend (laughs) more than you need to when you go to the grocery store. (laughs) <laughs> I, I get that. You know, yeah, a lot of times when I would go to the grocery store, I would buy like if it's like a bag of oranges or whatever the case is, and that takes a long time, you know, for one or two people to go through. So right. I find myself instead buying smaller quantities and like how you're talking about, and then it's like, oh, well, this isn't that bad. And and I love going to local farmer's markets yeah, because they seem to just, a lot of times you can get really good food there at, that's not as expensive as a grocery store. Definitely. I think it's, it's lower prices and higher quality. I think mm-hmm. that whenever I shop at the farmer's market, it, you know, it's picked fresh that morning, so it tastes so much better than it does coming from the grocery store where it's been in transit for a week. Yeah. yeah. And in, in places like where I live, I'm in Colorado, so a lot of times the food is coming from places where it's kind of like the green belt for looking at, you know, um, California or different other places that the food's right. not local here. And a lot of times they'll pick it green. So it's never quite the same, you know. Right, right. That, yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah. But there are ways around that because you can, I know um, a lot of people will say you can substitute frozen. Do you think that's correct? I think, frozen organic. You, I think you definitely can, and I, I do that sometimes, especially in the winter. I'll get I'll have frozen fruit and things that I've saved in the summer. I think that 
fresh is always best in my opinion, but I don't mm. think frozen is necessarily bad. Yeah, it's not going to be the the end end game there if you, if you use something frozen. So, well, and where do you see like gosh, you've you've got such great information on your blog, this fabulous book, The Colorful Kitchen. I love it. I mean, I've I've oh, been having you fun. So you even much. make kale look good, and then kale's not my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love to hear that. <laughs> because you have a dip, and I just, I just, I had it, and I lost it. I think it's kale, is a kale dip. There we go, oh, creamy baked kale creamy. and artichoke dip. Good, yes. goodness gracious, that looks great. So oh, I love that recipe. It's like a spinach and artichoke dip, but without the dairy. <laughs> and I see the sweet potato greens and uh, mac and cheese, and that looks. I can see why your daughter loves that because that just looks fabulous. And it's so great that this stuff just doesn't take a whole lot of time to prepare. Yeah, I mean, who really does have the time on an an average weeknight? How much time do you have to prepare your dinner? Maybe 15, 20 minutes, that's the max. Unless you prepare something ahead of time, you want to have dinner ready in less than half an hour. And so I like to make my recipes to fit into that type of timeline. Well, and so on that note, what is like a, a kitchen hack that you'd like to share with us that maybe, you know, that kind of would help people in the kitchen? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I would say, uh, I would say batch preparing your grains. So if I'm making brown mm-hmm. rice, let's say I'm making the teriyaki stir fry and I'm gonna, mm-hmm. and I'm making it for four people and I'm gonna make brown rice to go on the side, I would double that and make eight portions of brown rice or even go up to 12 and then that'll stay good in the refrigerator for up to five days and so throughout the week I can have I can serve soup over the rice or I can add the rice to a salad and that's just one less thing that I have to worry about and you can do that with quinoa or millet or whatever type of grain you're making and that's a great way to add in a whole carb a, a whole grain carbohydrate to anything that you're eating. Uh, it just makes it so much easier. That's a that's a great tip because a lot of times it's it's like gosh, I only want to make this because I might not want this tomorrow. But if it lasts for five days, I mean, you can make it and then have it like the day after or what have you. Right. You don't have to think, oh, I'm going to have to be eating the same meal every day for the rest of the week. You can find <laughs> different ways to utilize one item. <laughs> yeah, because that that could get a little harsh, but you make it. I mean, you're. That's one of the things I love is that you make things very simple and easy for people to do. That's my goal because I like things to be simple and I don't want to follow a complicated recipe. So I like to <laughs> keep it that way with the recipes that I share. Mm-hmm. So, you know, what's next on the horizon for you? My goodness, because you've got this great cookbook that just came out. Are you feeling like you're going to make another cookbook? Or you're, you're, you know, just, you know, people will be going to your blog for more information. What's next for you? I'm going to take a really long vacation, and then <laughs> I'm going to get back in the kitchen, and I just want to keep cooking and keep sharing recipes. I'm not. I'm really not totally sure what's going to be next. I love writing the, the process of writing a cookbook mm-hmm. and working on recipes every day and being able to continue doing that really would be my dream. Yeah, and and doing more of that, my goodness. Well, we've been talking about this pretty much the entire show. I've been referencing it. Why don't you um, share with us where our listeners can connect with you and be part of your community? Yeah, absolutely. So my website is thecolorfulkitchen.com. Um, if you use Instagram or Facebook, my my name is The Colorful Kitchen all over social media. And then you can find the links to buy the the book through my website and it's wherever books are sold. Oh yeah. And they can get it anywhere. (laughs) They can um, even order it as a holiday gift for anybody who's thinking about doing a plant-based diet or maybe people that just want to have a really great recipe book that has plant-based information in it too. 
Yeah, I think it would make a great holiday gift. I think that that's probably what I will be getting everyone on my list this year, actually. <laughs> Shh, we won't tell anybody, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to ruin the surprise. Well, you know, Eileen, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you so much. It was so fun to talk about food. Well, thank you, Eileen. We're going to be watching what comes out of your kitchen next. I like to... Thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information.